Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure um, to have the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, of the United Nations with us here today. Uh, the Secretary General, we know, has um, a long experience in uh, international affairs, a Prime Minister of uh, Portugal, but also High Commissioner for Refugees uh, for many years. People are very uh, excited, uh, of course, uh, Secretary General, uh, to have you here. It is a complicated uh, world that we are uh, faced with. Um, but I think there is a strong feeling here among the participants at our annual meeting that uh, in a truly multipolar world, uh, we also really need the United Nations to navigate and also we need um, the multilateral cooperation and more cooperation and not less cooperation. We are very much looking forward uh, to hear your um, intervention uh, speech. The Secretary General didn't want to do it from a lectern. He shows uh, that he will speak to us uh, off the cuff uh, sitting and then I'll uh, try to um, come up with some uh, questions. Secretary General, floor is yours and welcome to Davos. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, my dear friend. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for being here. If I had to select one sentence to describe the state of the world, I would say we are in a world in which global challenges are more and more integrated and the responses are more and more fragmented. And if this is not reversed, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, if one looks at uh, uh, global politics and uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, the global economy and the, the mega trends, the climate change, the movement of people, digitalization. The truth is that they are more and more interlinked, interfering more and more with each other. And indeed, the problems are global, but the responses are fragmented. Looking at the global economy, we are now uh, growing still with a relatively acceptable uh, GDP growth, uh, 3.1 last year, but slowing down. And everybody agrees that there are dark clouds in the horizon and that there are risks. And if one looks at the risks, there is really an, an interrelation of those risks with all the other aspects of the uh, global international relations. The first risk is probably trade tensions, and trade tensions are today essentially a political problem. A second risk, of course, related to the debt uh, that is much higher than in the last uh, financial crisis and which is uh, limiting the capacity to respond to any potential emerging crisis and uh, uh, also limiting the capacity of states to um, implement the projects that would be necessary to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But in any case, it remains essentially an economic dimension of the problem. Then we have the instability in financial markets. And there, clearly, it's a matter of confidence. So political events have an influence on that. And if one looks at the shutdowns and the, the Brexit saga, there is a certain sentence that Political systems do not know exactly what to do when dealing with problems that have strong economic impacts. And so that is a factor of lack of confidence. And a factor of lack of confidence creates or increases instability in the markets. And then the climate risk. And I think the climate risk is the most important systemic risk for the near future. Uh, I believe we are losing the race. Climate change is running faster than what we are. And we have this paradox. The reality is proving to be worse than what science has foreseen, and all the last indicators show that. We are moving dramatically into a runaway climate change if we are not able to stop it. And at the same time, I see the political will slowing down. These when technology is on our side, and when we see more and more the business community ready to respond in a positive way, and the civil society more and more engaged. But the political will is still very slow. And we see lots of subsidies to fossil fuels, we see carbon pricing in a very limited way, and we see many still putting into doubt whether climate change is a, a, a threat. But in my opinion, it's uh, the most important global systemic threat in relation to the global economy. And then we have aspects that are more complex. 
But it's true that globalization, with all its fantastic uh, improvements uh, in the world uh, and uh, the technological progress linked to it, has increased inequality at country level, especially inside countries. And uh, there's people that was left behind, uh, people, sectors, regions, that has created a, a sense of frustration in the rust belt of this world. And this has been a factor of reducing confidence, confidence, trust in governments, in, in, social, in, um, uh, in political establishments, and in international organizations like ours. And this also makes it more difficult to have uh, effective strategies in dealing with uh, economic problems. And then uh, the fact that uh, growth has been uneven and that we have a number of least developed countries in which per capita gra uh, growth is stagnant, this is creating development gaps that are a factor of instability and of conflict linked to other violations of human rights and other aspects. And so there is this unevenness in, uh, the, in, in growth is a factor of potential uh, increase in conflict. And countries that are able to solve conflicts always at risk of going back into those con uh, conflicts. And then if we look at the political megatrends it is clear for me that we are witnessing a multiplication of conflicts more and more interrelated and more and more related to a threat of global terrorism, but at the same time the response is more and more fragmented. We no longer live in a bipolar or unipolar world, but we are not yet in a multipolar world. We are in a kind of a chaotic situation of transition. Uh, power relations became unclear. The relationship between the three uh, most important powers, Russia, the United States, and China, has never been as dysfunctional as it is today, and this is true for the economy, but it's also true in the paralysis of the Security Council in many very important aspects. We see the emergence of medium-sized powers that start to be very influent in different scenarios. It's impossible to look at what happened in Syria without recognizing the role of Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and we can do the same in other conflicts around the world. So, power relations becoming unclear, fragmentation of actions, impunity and unpredictability prevailing. And when you say, and you said, and it's right, that we are probably moving into a multipolar world, let's have no doubts. Multipolarity, it might be a factor of equilibrium, but it's not necessarily a factor of peace and security. We had Europe before the First World War, a multipolar Europe, but in the absence of multilateral mechanisms of cooperation and governance, we had the First World War. So um, it is very important to recognize the importance of multilateral mechanisms. And if I would go on with the megatrends that I mentioned, uh, climate change, uh, the movement of people that today became a central political problem, or uh, the questions related to digitalization, we would see in all of them more and more linkage between politics, economy, uh, technology, uh, movement, of all these situations more and more interlinked, and the enormous difficulty of the international community at country level and at global level to respond in a global way. And uh, uh, this brings us to the center of the debate today. I am a multilateralist. I am deeply convinced that there is no other way to deal with global challenges but with global responses and organized in a multilateral way. But I think that uh, it's not enough to say this. And it's also not enough to vilify those that disagree uh, with these and uh, just consider them as nationalists or populists or whatever. I think we need to understand the grievances and to understand the, 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 the reasons why, the, the root causes of why large sectors of the population in different parts of the world today disagree with us. And we need to address those root causes and we need to show these people that we care for them. And the problem is that to a large extent political establishments and international organizations during large periods let these people be left behind in those, as I mentioned, rust belts of these worlds, and did not show that they cared. And people would think, oh, politicians, they just take care of their own interests and the elections and whatever, and we are here, we are abandoned, we don't see a future, our jobs are lost, we can't re rebuild our lives, we feel insecure with everything that has happened. We need to be able to address the concerns of these people, to talk to them and to act in relation to them. And for that, I think we need a multilateralism that is simultaneously networked to make sure that we are able to address complex challenges, 
very important for the UN to be in close cooperation, as it is today with the World Bank and the IMF, but also with all regional organizations, the, the, the World Trade Organization. We need to work together. There is no way we can do isolated responses to the problems we face. They are all interlinked, and it needs to be a inclusive multilateralism. It needs to be a multilateralism in which not only states are part of the system, but in which more and more the business community, the civil society, uh, the academia, they are all part of uh, uh, the way to analyze problems, to define strategies, to define policies, and then to implement them. There is no way governments or intergovernmental organizations alone can deal with climate change, can deal with the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, or can deal with migration. We need more and more a multilateralism that also is able to incorporate the contribution of all these other sectors, and I think the World Economic Forum has an absolutely vital role to play on these. And if you ask me what are the priorities for me in the UN for these at the present moment, I would uh, raise three. First, to demonstrate to all those that today are not in favor of multilateralism, that we care for them, to demonstrate to all those that are feeling that they were left behind, that our ideas, our policies, our programs aim at solving their problems or helping them to solve them, and that is the reason why we try to look at the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals as an inclusive process to leave no one behind. And there, a huge cooperation is necessary, obviously, with the business community and with member states in general and with the civil society. But clearly, to make people understand that this is not a, a, an abstract debate on global development, this is something linked to the concerns that people have about the future of their jobs, about the future of their communities, and this is even more important when we know the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Second concern, to tell people clearly, look, we understand that for, our, for you, we in the UN, we have problems of bureaucracy, we have problems of being too heavy, we need to reform, and we are reforming. We have launched a very substantial, robust program of reform aiming at simplification of procedures, decentralization. I just sent 200 letters to 200 managers giving them powers they never had in relation to staff management, budget, procurement, and other aspects to make them take decisions closer to the point of delivery, closer to the people we deal with. Uh, and then transparency and accountability that is essential to prove taxpayers that they have value for money in what we do. And then the third aspect, that uh, for me is a priority is to show the added value of the United Nations. And there I must say, I think we are doing things. I mean, look at December last year. We were able uh, to bring together the international community in Katowice. Everybody thought Katowice would be a failure. It was not. We managed to approve the work program of the, um, uh, of the Paris Agreement. It doesn't solve the problem of we need more ambition. Uh, more ambition in mitigation, in, 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 th that was not solved there, but it was possible to bring together countries that were in a totally different position to at least agree on uh, uh, the basis to, to move forward. Uh, nobody believed that it was possible to have an agreement, a, a first agreement in Yemen. It was possible. It would be very difficult to move, but we are pushing for a surge in diplomacy for peace, and many other situations have been improving in recent times. South Sudan is looking better. Ethiopia, that is not our merit. It's the merit of the Prime Minister, has done a fantastic uh, step forward in relation to um, uh, uh, Eritrea. So a surge in diplomacy for peace, I think, is something that we are proving that we are there, that we are doing things that are necessary, and that nobody can replace the UN uh, in this work. A second aspect uh, that I would like to underline on, on this is uh, the fact that in the, in the humanitarian world, the UN still represents more than half of the humanitarian aid distributed around the world. We have, we have we supported last year 100 million people in 40 countries, mobilizing 15 billion US dollars. And I think that the work the UN does is absolutely irreplaceable. And looking at World Food Program, UNICEF, UNHCR, what is happening in the world would be, the tragedy would be much bigger without this work. So I think we have an added value that is proven, but it's clear we need to accelerate, accelerate in 2019. 
accelerate in the surge in the diplomacy for peace, accelerate in relation to climate change, and we'll have a summit in which we want more ambition in, in mitigation, in adaptation, in finance, and in innovation, and to make governments understand that they are not doing enough, and to mobilize as much as possible the business community and the civil society, and then accelerate in relation to the perspectives of the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, and create the conditions to mobilize the business community, to mobilize the, 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 the civil society, because obviously Governments cannot do it alone. And this is a central question of this inclusive multilateralism. Is the recognition, whether people like it or not, that the power of governments to shape societies and the power of governments to solve problems is today much more limited. And if we want to have a true multilateral system, we need, of course, to have an intergovernmental perspective, but we need to make sure that we bring together into this multilateral system, the voice and the influence of the business community, the civil society, the scientific community, and all those others that are essential to address together the very dramatic problems we are facing. Thank you very much. What an uh, impressive uh, summing up in 15 minutes on tour uh, of the horizon um, of the world. Uh, I think we're very privileged uh, to have a Secretary General that uh, are so proactive uh, on all these uh, important issues. Um, you mentioned this uh, with uh, a multipolar world. We're not yet there. We, we maybe have like a G2 composition. We also have the three uh, powers of Russia, uh, China, as U.S., uh, you mentioned. But in addition to a multipolar world that we're seeing more and more, because we're seeing uh, also uh, other uh, countries more assertive uh, than before, and if there is a vacuum, it will be tried to be filled. We have, have this notion of multi-conceptual world. And that adds to the complications, because this is um, also seen as um, asking questions around human rights, and also uh, agreements that we have had uh, in the UN, um, the rules-based world order. When you look at um, human rights, uh, look at uh, gender um, and um, the rights of girls for education uh, in the world, um, that are crucial uh, issues. Some are saying, oh, these are Western values, but these are really universal values. Can we do more to protect this? And are you concerned that these values are under pressure? Uh, I think that it varies. Um, uh, but it is clear that, in general, we can say that we have witnessed, probably because governments feel weaker in relation to the solution of the problems that they face, we have witnessed in several parts of the world the national sovereignty agenda gaining ground in relation to the um, human rights agenda. And so it is clear that in several parts of the world we see the civil society space shrinking, we see media freedom uh, being uh, negatively impacted, uh, and we see uh, 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 the expression of forms of authoritarian, authoritarianism or uh, this new fantastic expression that uh, was invented, illiberal democracy. So this is clear. Uh, the human rights agenda is in trouble, and we need to make sure that we mobilize the international community, and again, the civil society has a key role to play on this for human rights to be protected. Now, gender is different in the sense that in gender, I think that we are witnessing a gigantic movement for gender equality coming from uh, uh, the, the rank and file, from the society. We have many governments clearly in this direction. We are in the UN totally committed. We have reached gender parity at the level of this, uh, the um, senior management group and the, uh, the t of our team leaders around the world. It's true, those are the ones I appoint directly, so it's easier to have gender parity. But even in the system, we have now a roadmap to reach full gender parity in 2028 with the agreement of member states. And I see in many other countries a lot of efforts being done uh, in relation to uh, uh, bringing, children, bringing uh, uh, girls to, to school, uh, fighting uh, genital mutilation, fighting early marriage. So th th there's a number of things that is happening, but it's not enough. Um, but in general, I would say the human rights 
situation in general is worse than what we are seeing in gender, where I still, well, I see now some progress. In some areas we are, re, we have, we are having a regression. In other areas we have some progress. And I hope that in gender we are making some progress. Of course, there is a long way to go. This is a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture. And uh, uh, this is essentially a question of power. And we know that all, it's always difficult for power to be given. Normally, power has to be taken. Secretary General, you also mentioned uh, the importance of collaboration between governments, business, and civil society. And uh, um, our partnership between the UN and the World Economic Forum here, I think, is uh, very uh, important. And uh, as you said, governments cannot do things alone anymore. You have to mobilize also the private sector that is 75% of the global uh, GDP. So uh, moving forward, I think uh, collaboration with business, and you have some of the key CEOs uh, in the world here, is crucial when it comes to fighting climate change, but also to meet the sustainable development goals, eradicate all extreme poverty by 2030. And we're not on track on this. So what would your challenge be uh, to the business uh, community or your invitation to the business community in the coming years? I think we need to have uh, uh, action on several fronts together. I've been talking to many uh, financial institutions, for instance, about uh, the need to support investments in many developing countries. And usually the answer is related to problems of governance uh, and the questions of corruption and others. So that is why one of the goals is exactly related to governance, is exactly related to improved governance, improved capacity of member states, especially the least developed member states, to be able to attract private investment and to be able to have normal relations uh, with private investment uh, in, the, in the working of their economies. So we need to act with member states to create the conditions for adequate governments, for a rules-based relationship with the private sector. We need to mobilize the private sector uh, in order to invest in those countries. And we need working with governments, with uh, uh, aid uh, uh, entities, and with the financial system to uh, find some new instruments or to uh, increase some the uh, impact of instruments to reduce the risks of investment in many of these countries. And a lot has been done, as you know, in insurance. A lot has been done in relation to um, different forms of financing. Um, now we have the green bonds, we have social bonds. So a lot needs to be done to make sure that we are able to create the, the combination of these things. A welcoming, invent, a welcoming environment in the least developed countries, a commitment of the private sector to invest, and the creation of a number of instruments to reduce the risks of that investment in order to make sure to address the huge gaps that we have in the social development goals in uh, uh, the, a large chunk of the least developed countries. Secretary General, you also mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we have no developments uh, in areas like artificial uh, intelligence, internet of things, precision medicine, and drones that are happening at an unparalleled pace. And uh, you know also that the World Economic Forum works on the fourth industrial revolution. And this morning, I was with African leaders saying that we lost out on the first, second, and the third industrial revolution, but we're not planning to lose out on the fourth. We will have to leapfrog. And we also see that there is a big technological competition between the big nations. And we know in the platform economy, the winner easily uh, takes it all. How do you see the UN playing a constructive role here um, that uh, this fourth industrial revolution can also be an inclusive revolution and a revolution that gains all uh, the population of this world? I see three platforms of action. Well, first, the impact of uh, a fourth industrial revolution, which artificial intelligence has probably the leading role, the impact in the economies and societies will be huge. There will be a massive destruction of jobs and a massive co creation of jobs. The problem is that they are not the same jobs and not requiring the same skills. And I think that uh, the World Economic Forum has been doing a lot to uh, raise awareness and, and to find solutions. Over 
But let's be clear, we need to mobilize much more governments and the business community and the civil society to understand what kind of impact are we going to have in the next decades and what kind of measures do we need to start taking now in order to respond to it? Educational systems. It, it doesn't really matter now how much you learn, how many things you learn. What matters is how you learn to learn because you will be doing completely different things in your life. Uh, skill, question of safety nets, a new generation of safety nets able to address the kind of... So there is a lot that I believe the UN can be a platform for discussion, a business community of governments within the sustainable development goals uh, the discussion in order to try to address the massive impact that the fourth industrial revolution will have on societies and the economies and to try to prevent instead of react. And then, of course, the concept of work will change. The relations between work, leisure, work time, leisure, other occupations will change. These are things we need to discuss much more in the international community and prepare for what's coming. Then there is a second level in which we are now very much engaged with the, the, the high-level panel on digital cooperation. When we look at the web, no, uh, it's clear that the web is a fantastic instrument for all of us. It's clear that we have the dark web and the deep web and all the problems of uh, cybersecurity, etc. And the question of regulation is a very complex question in relation to this. My feeling is that there is no way to use here traditional mechanisms of intergovernmental regulations through conventions that are approved and then agencies that... Uh, now, I think that this is the kind of situation in which we need soft um, uh, mechanisms. We need to bring together all stakeholders, governments, the business community, the scientists community, uh, the civil society, and create mechanisms that allow for um, a permanent following of what's happening, for the consensus in a, creating some norms and protocols, but not with rigid forms of uh, uh, bureaucratization, I would say, of regulation, and creating with this the possibility of more and more to have to be an instrument for good. And at the same time, taking into account that the web is also a question that some governments are using from the point of view of uh, violation of human rights, etc. So it is clear for me this cannot be only an intergovernmental process. And then I think we have a third area of great interest for us, which is linked uh, with dimensions of peace and security of artificial intelligence, the weaponization of artificial intelligence. Uh, we have an agreement, for instance, today, uh, a general agreement that international law applies to the cyberspace, but there is no agreement on how international humanitarian law applies to the cyber dimension of conflict. There is no agreement what self-defense means in the case of uh, uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we are witnessing the emergence of uh, systems of weapons that will be autonomous and in which it will be possible for those weapons to decide on targets and to decide on taking out the life of people without any human intervention in situations in which there is a reach of escalation and there is no accountability. Now, how to handle these situations is this discussion is a discussion in which we are in the beginning, in which there are big differences of opinion. But this is an, these are the areas where we still need international law and in which the role of the United Nations, and namely of the Second Commission of the um, uh, General Assembly, is vital. We need to find a minimum of consensus in the world on how to uh, integrate these new technologies in the laws of war that we defined decades ago in a completely different context. Thank you. Uh, last question, uh, Secretary General. Um, we live in a complicated and complex world, that's for sure. Uh, we don't uh, necessarily act like we're in the same boat, but the reality is that we are in the same boat. So um, what happens in one country affects the other and etc. But when you looked uh, at the last year, I know there has been some positive developments too. You mentioned um, Ethiopia and Eritrea. I've been Davos last year, would say that there would be peace. No one would have believed that. We also, uh, under uh, your leadership and the UN Special Envoy, making some progress uh, in Yemen. That is a big humanitarian uh, catastrophe. But if you look at, uh, at the coming year, um, what uh, are your aspirations? Where, where do you see the silver linings um, uh, moving forward? Because we, I think we should end on an optimistic note because there is a lot of positive things happening in the world. There is a wind too. of hope. 
that is blowing, and I think Ethiopia was crucial for this wind of hope, that is blowing in relation to uh, the dramatic conflict situation we have in many parts of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, my intention is to intensify our surge in diplomacy for peace and to enhance our partnerships with regional organizations. It is the case of the African Union, it is the case of the regional African, it's the case of other parts of the world. And to do everything possible to bring a number of situations in which until now it was not possible to launch a serious political process, to bring those situations into a serious political process. Um, countries like Central African Republic, South Sudan, countries like uh, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, uh, Syria with all its complexity, are countries where we would like to make huge progress next year. And then we have situations in which uh, what I was saying about how everything is interlinked uh, are clear uh, that they require innovative forms of handling them, the Sahel. In the Sahel you have conflict, you have terrorism, you have uh, climate change impacting dramatically, you have uh, uh, huge uh, problems of uh, um, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, lack of development. Uh, 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 and uh, you have problems of governance that are very serious. So it's, it's a whole area in which all these mega problems are combined and in which we need to, that is why we need this kind of multilateralism that is networking to address everything at the same time in combination and inclusive. Uh, because this is the kind of area that proves that the systems that we have that still are fragmented are not able to respond to the kind of problems that more and more, more and more we are having in the future, in which everything is interconnected and all answers need to be comprehensive. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary General.